Well, welcome everybody to um, another Kings of Anglia special. Hello, friends from all around the world, from um, Ipswich to Suffolk, Ipswich in Australia, Ipswich in America, or wherever else you are, all around the world. I'm Mike Bacon, and as you can see, um, aka the big pork thing, where it's supposed to be, pork, poncho, whatever. Um, I'm standing in, I'm off the bench. And, and thankfully for a little longer than James Norwood had on Saturday, folks. But that's neither here nor there. Um, uh, Mark Heath, the Heath monster. Uh, well, it's all got too much for him. Again, this is not the first time. And uh, we have to better look at He's from the highs of the 6-0 thrashing of Doncaster to the lows of 2-1 at Accrington. He's, 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 gone, he's gone too high and he's gone too low. Um, last uh, last heard laying down uh, in a bed in his uh, uh, in his house, uh, surrounded by <laughs> incense candles and mood music. Partly just recovering from the ups and downs of the Ipswich Town fan. The Heath Monster will be back on, at the end of the week, but I'm in here now for the time being. So apologies if you don't really um, can't put up with too much of this, but I hope you can because we've got some great guests here. And we're not guests, are they? are friends. They're my friends. They're your friends. And three guys who, despite the fuel crisis, despite subways being closed on the A1, made their way up to Accrington and back all in the same day. No, there's no night stops with these guys. Um, they're here uh, to chat about all things Kings Vanger, all things Ipswich Town. What a hopeless result that was, but we hopefully have, we'll have more fun than just that hopeless result. I've start first by introducing, um, well, he's called the chief football writer. Chief he is. He's, he's a chief man among chiefs. He is Mr. <laughs> Stuart Watson. Stuart, I hope you enjoyed my intro there. Um, I've run out of things to say already. So over to you. How are you, my friend? That was quite possibly my favourite intro ever to a Thank Kings you. of Anglia podcast in all the time we've been doing this. What What are you now? The Pork Poncho? Is that... I, <laughs> I don't know what I'm called. I think he calls me Pork something. Porker, the big porker, the, the pork, the ponch, something, I don't know. I like the Pork Poncho. Um, <laughs> like a big ham cape that you would wear over your head when it's raining. Um, I'm very well, my friends. Um, yeah. Not not as well as after the the six nil win, I had to come back back for this one. But um, there we go. We had a nice day out, didn't we, Andy? We always have a nice day out. Um, I just want to hear more from you, please, Poncho. Um, I've I've not got anything to add. Just no. you, you can you can you can take it from here, Pon Ponchosaurus. Well, Ponchosaurus, thank you very much, Andy. Well, of course, I haven't you haven't let me introduce you, which is a little bit disappointing, but I will now introduce you um, because you. here you are, um, Andy Andy the Hutch Warren. Um, of course, oh, we, we missed him um, well, missed him a few weeks ago when I was last on. He wasn't here, which is very disappointing. But he's here now. And uh, Andy, how, how are you? Because obviously, you know, you you and, and your and your and your top man, Mr. Watson, were were, were reporting on the game. Um, and uh, are you are you well? Uh, is everything okay? I'm very well. Very, very well. Um, very yeah, very, very, very well. Excellent. What good news that is. Very, very well a lot of times. And finally, the third member. Well, obviously, there's four of us here today, so he's not really a third member. He's a third member plus me, so that makes four. Anyway, the fourth member here um, on the Kings' Island, of course, it's, it's, the, it's the man who um, takes videos and deletes them. It's the Roscoe Ross. <laughs> Ross calls Ross. Roscoe Ross. They call you Roscoe, apparently. Roscoe Ross. Ross, how are you, my friend? Uh, I'm speechless after that intro. Um, I don't know what else to say to add that. More, hashtag more bacon is going to be trending once again. Well, absolutely. Well, I'll, obviously I'll kick that off, but I mean, that's for another day. Um, but Ross, I mean, obviously you did, you did, you did a bit of it. Let's start with you, Ross, because obviously that, you know, let's, how, how are the, from the highs of Doncaster, how were the town faithful? What brilliant, nearly a thousand of them going up to Accrington, standing in that awful weather and fuel crisis and all this. I mean, what a, what a set of fans we have here at Ipswich Town. They are so lucky. Um, and yet, um, not the greatest uh, after that Accrington 2, Ipswich 1, Ross. How was their reactions? It's uh, it's the hope that kills you, really, don't it? I think the fans were on the high. They are looking forward to going to Accrington. Open terrace and the forecast didn't look good. It was better, though. In terms of weather-wise, we were fearing it was going to be torrential rain, tropical rain all game long. But thankfully, it was a bit, a bit better than first thought. Um, but yeah, um, Aquitaine is definitely our bogey side. I know we've won a few games there, a few games against Aquitaine at home. But as I say, the Wham Stadium is just a stadium where you just can't get that result. And it was a miserable afternoon at Aquitaine. And uh, yeah, the fans weren't happy after the game. And there was one fan, I had to delete the video. <laughs> um, because he swore a lot in it. Um, basically, Paul Cook, you know, you know the rest, sort it out. 
You keep deleting videos, Ross, but I mean that's that's fine. We don't mind that. But I mean, obviously, let's go to our let's go to our to, to our men, our men. I was going to say our men with the pens, but of course you don't have pens anymore. Do you? It's all laptops, isn't it, Stewie and Andy Stewie? Um, a, a, a fine quote from you in today's East Anglia Daily Times. Don't matter. Bullied in League One, no longer. We thought those days were over. Um, go on then, Stuart. Resume of Saturday afternoon. Yeah. I... Ross mentioned the sort of the sticky record at Accrington and Ipswich. They've lost three of the four games there now. And the other one last season, they won, but were desperately clinging on against 10 men when Paul Cook was just been appointed and was watching from the stands. Um, and I thought it might be a little bit different this time going into it. I had sort of confidence that Ipswich weren't going to play the likes of Accrington and Rotherham at this level and, and get bullied anymore. Um, and I know they'd gone to sort of Burton and Cheltenham earlier in the season and there was an element of that with sort of faltering under the long throws and Burton sticking the ball on top of them time and time again. But Burgess hadn't been signed, I think, for the for the Burton. Well, he, he didn't play against Cheltenham. Then he came in sort of literally days later for the... For the uh, Cheltenham game. I'm trying to remember which way around they were. Edmondson hadn't wasn't fit by that point. Morsi hadn't got wasn't in the team by that point. So I'm thinking by this stage, Ipswich should have been better equipped to deal with this type of match. And in the end, they weren't. Um, it was a bit like those away games that I've just mentioned, where Accrington wanted to make it a game of chaos rather than control. And that play, as is their right, they came into this in really bad form. They conceded 12 goals in their previous three games and they wanted to make this a, a fight game, a second balls game, picking up the bits and pieces, just continually sticking it on top of Ipswich in the final third, never letting them settle. And um, the, the frustrating thing for me is that they'd done the hard part. They'd kind of come through that first half. They'd managed to get that one moment of quality with Salinas through ball and Bonds Johnny on the spot again, 1-0 up. And you think, OK, just calm it down now. See out 5, 10, 15 minutes of the second half. Do exactly what you did at Lincoln. Get a nice professional away win. Um, and they didn't, did they, Andy? They just sort of uh, crumbled under a bit of a barrage of, of long balls and, and pressure. And that was a bit of a worrying thing for me. Yeah. Yeah, that was the, the that was the big thing for me. I think it was clear quite early in this game that it wasn't going to be a good game of football to watch. However, however it played out, I think I think there's probably an ele element of Accrington going that little bit more solid in an attempt to kind of stop their own troubles, which had seen them concede what was it twelve in three going into this game. I think they were maybe even more sort of compact than we'd seen them previously. Um, but you're right, they did the hard work. It was an ugly first half. It, they had one shot on target and scored it. And if you remove the half-time interval from this, that they've conceded within 10 minutes again, which is which is a, a, an early season problem, which which has cost them a lot of points now. Um, and from there, they they never they never got a foothold back in the game. Really, the the, the three players playing behind Bon of um, Fraser, Selena. And Wes Burns, all three of those need the ball to their feet uh, if they're going to be effective. They never got it, um, and it was just huffing and huffing and puffing. And um, eventually, it was Ipswich's house that got that got blown down with um, with a goal ten minutes ten minutes from time. Very very disappointing because, like you say, Stu, you, you look at the team actually, and they've got all the tools in there to deal with that kind of game. Maybe you could have looked at it in the past, and midfield was a bit more lightweight in the past, arguably, with someone like Andre Dezel in there, whose game isn't to 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 fight and tussle away, but now it's Morsi and Evans should be a bit more fit for that. Edmondson and Burgess, you look at them, they're they're solid, like grown up defenders, even though they're not they're not 35, they're they're in their mid twenties. Uh, but but they're made for they're made for fights like that, and it just didn't. It didn't happen. Even even someone like Janoi Danassian, the, the right back, is more of a solid defender than Kane Vincent Young's been in there. So you look at it; all the tools were there, but for whatever reason, it just it just didn't happen again. Mm, that's right. And I think the thing is, Stu. I mean, I don't. Know, I looked at the team sheet, and when of course you got Morsey and Evans together, 
which everyone had been sort of, people didn't quite know who was going to play alongside Morsi definitely to start with. Evans obviously come in and done the business. And I suppose you, what Andy's saying is right. I mean, those two as a midfield holding duo look strong or on, on paper are strong. I'm sure it's exactly what you need in that type of game. Yeah, it should be. And they got a little bit a little bit outnumbered in mid in midfield, perhaps. Atkinson, as Andy said, went probably quite ultra pragmatic after the results that they'd had, understandably so. They played sort of pretty much five at the back out of possession. In front of them, they had a kind of a box four-man midfield, so two two sitters, and then sort of two in front of them in support of the striker. So out of possession, they were they had seven men behind the ball most of the time. But when they got the ball, they got it forward early up to Colby Bishop up front, who we know is a handful. And then they had sort of two men picking up the bits and pieces, notably um, Harry Pell, who, who was a handful. So they were difficult to break down, but then they just lumped it up on top of Ipswich quite quickly and just had numbers. And even if they didn't win the first ball cleanly, they were they were quickest to those second balls. And that's where Cook's talking about the sort of the desire and the hunger and just... Sometimes if the game's not going your way and you're not being able to do everything the way you want to do it, just just go back to basics and start just just want getting to that ball quicker than the opposition, fighting for that ball a little bit more. And I just wonder whether Tuesday night and that 6-0 win, even on a subconscious level, just saw a little bit complacency, dare I say, arrogance creep in from Ipswich that, you know, that's it, we've clicked now. We've got all our players up to speed. We've stuck six goals past someone. We get up. We've got quality in the camp. We play. And that comes maybe a little bit from Paul Cook. It's very much, it's not about them. It's about us. And we just focus on our game and we play the same way every week and it will come good. And sometimes the opposition dictates what you have to do. And that comes on to the debate then, no one has any arguments that you pick an unchanged side, you go again after a 6-0. But do you have to realise within a game that this ain't going our way today and we, we need to adapt accordingly? Um, and that seems to be the big debate coming out of this one. Um, could it could Paul Cook have done more to change that storyline as it, as it unfolded? Because we could all see what was happening unfolding in front of our eyes. Easier said than done, changing the pattern of play. Is it on the players just to just to fight and battle that little bit more or, or could tactically things have changed a little bit? That's the kind of the debate that comes out of this game. Mm. Roscoe, you were you obviously down on, down. no doubt, were you getting wet? I imagine you were getting quite wet hanging around there because you, usually I see you where you've got a sort of a yellow sort of bib on or something with no hat, you're usually getting drowned. But I mean, um, no, I mean, the, I mean, but for you, I mean, you, you know, you and, and many of the town fans who have travelled up there with such high hopes. It must have, you know, did you see it? Do you see it all going wrong as it was unfolding? Yeah. The first half, of course, we were one nil up at, in the first half and we thought, OK, this, um, it wasn't great first half. You know, there wasn't many chances. As, as Stu said, it was a just a, a game of nothingness, really. There's nothing going on, not many chances, just balls up in the air. Um, and you know, with Macaulay Bon up front, he, he had nothing going for him. You know, I know he's got his goal, but he had nothing else there for him. But uh, just from just that first half for me, just thought this is just going to go bad in the second half, and fans were getting frustrated. And the atmosphere, from my, my opinion, was very flat because it's a very open ground, Accrington, but just the atmosphere is flat. I was thinking, do you know what? I'm not going to have any good content for game day this week because there's just no atmosphere, there's nothing going on in the game. And um, yeah, it all went wrong in the second half. And uh, of course, the weather didn't help. It was a miserable day. But uh, yeah, I think Cook maybe should have done a few changes, maybe mixed up a little bit because we just weren't winning any balls. And their defenders, seven foot defenders, number 12 for them, well, it was a standout player for me. He, he was winning everything. Um, but yeah, fans from the highs of winning 6 0 to then traveling to Aquiton, a long trip to Aquiton on a, on a Saturday morning. And then to, to go home, you know, defeated um, a lot of um, yeah, disappointing fans leaving the ground. It was that little mm. period between the equaliser on 50 minutes and then the Accrington winner didn't come to, what, 79? Yeah. So there's about half an hour window there where you could tell the game was going a certain way. After they equalised, their small but very vocal pocket of fans between that goal sort of... Uh, raise the noise levels a, a little bit more. As Ross says, the away 
side of things was was a little bit flat understandably so long journey they're getting soaked with rain that it's a really crap game of football to watch um and it just it, that that second Accrington goal felt like it was coming and it didn't feel like it was coming for four or five minutes it felt like it was coming for a prolonged time so there was a window to react there um for Paul Cook saying that and knowing what the answer was is a different thing a lot of people have just been going well James Norwood should have come on sooner than he was introduced after the second goal went in straight after that. People, I think Alex Matthey said on the radio that that could have happened 10 minutes earlier. And I can see the logic between Norwood being a feisty, fighty character and being well suited to that sort of game. And I can see that maybe thinking about it, and this is in hindsight, I might not have thought about this during the game, but maybe Ipswich needed to go like for like. And, you know, maybe Toto Enciala is someone that they could have looked at a little bit sooner with the ball getting chucked on top of them time and time again, you go to three at the back or if, even if you don't think Toto's ready, touch an Oidenassian in, inside, he can play centrally quite comfortably and just, just change formation a little bit possibly. And there's it. Cook has made it very, very clear that this is his formation. This is the way he plays. But I think this is a quote he's used himself in terms of styles make fights. And sometimes, you know, you've got to accept that, things aren't going against you and, you know, in boxing terms, get dirty and fight on the inside and just, I don't know, it just um, it felt like an inevitability about that second goal and, and, and eventually it did come and that that's what made it so frustrating. Mm, that's right. I suppose just well, Heathy's not here because now you start mentioning fighting, Stewie. He'd have been yeah. off like a he'd been off like a good and telling us all the ins and outs of the fight game. But um, I mean, Andy, people have a thing about formations. Don't they? I have a little bit of a thing about formations. I must be honest. I, I four two three one. I don't particularly like, but that's neither here. Obviously, I'm wrong um, because I'm not a coach. So um, well, I was, but not not a very good one. But um, people have a thing about formations, Andy. I mean, do you do you look at it as you're watching the game? Do you do you do you bother about formations? That do you think Ipswich got it right? What I'm not, but bo- I'm maybe going to contradict myself with what I what I say here. I'm not bothered about formations. Uh, I do actually quite like, in theory. I've said this so many times: the four-two-three-one. In theory, I like it, but you have to adapt within that, and it's about matchups. It's not necessarily about formations. It's about matchups. You can have little tweaks here, like you can still play that same system, but maybe. Maybe you look at that that three behind the striker of, of Burns, Fraser, Selina, and you think we're just not getting these guys the ball today. You need one, either one of them or someone to come on to play that little bit deeper in the midfield, which, again, would help the match up with the Accrington midfield. Maybe, I know we've seen Harper a bit higher up the pitch of late, but maybe Harper could have come on a bit, a bit earlier for, for one of those attackers and, and dropped a bit deeper and, and tried to just try to get the ball because that, that that's Ipswich weren't able to use their attacking players because they didn't have the ball on the floor to use. Um, but I, I, I do, I do think a, a bit much gets made sometimes about formations because um, fundamentally, I think a lot of players on that pitch on Saturday didn't win their own personal battles. Some of them weren't put in the, some of them had the odds stacked against them maybe because of the matchups they were facing. But in terms of winning individual battles i think I, I don't think any of the players on the pitch are mm. beyond beyond question um in in term in terms of that and i think it comes down more to a probably more to a mindset thing yeah, i i would say i'm with you andy i think everyone suddenly just jumps straight to the manager after a game like this and it's like it's cook and it kind of gets the players off the hook a little bit for me. I don't know if this is increasingly a modern phenomenon in, in football, but every phone in every debate after a game, regardless of whether people have been to the game or not, pick apart the manager's tactics and substitutions. And sometimes it just comes down to the players. You, you've got 11 good players on that football pitch that should be capable of adapting and, and winning that football match. And, and did they adapt? You know, they should be intelligent players that sort of adapt the way they're playing that day. And the answer is no at this mm. uh, at the weekend. So um, it felt like typical Ipswich, didn't it? Ipswich, just false dawns and backward steps just seems to be the, the norm for Ipswich Town over recent years. And this last week just kind of encapsulates everything that we've come to know and 
dislike love. about this football club. <laughs> yeah, love. <laughs> what we love about it. This is what we love about it so much: the highs and the lows. Um, I, I went to Brighton this week, and um, there was there was no big dipper. I mean, because it gets a high and a low. I like going on like you go to Blackpool. This is the big one, isn't there? We can go on a roller coaster. Highs and lows. Um, yeah, Stu. I just think I don't know what I'm talking about there for for that for a second. But anyway, Stu, I will just go back to what you were saying about players take responsibility. But often when you get these days after matches, you get managers often say blame me, don't you? They seem to as though the players can't handle the don't blame them blame them. and you get it in all levels of the game it's that was my decision i'll take the blame for that look that don't blame i i blame you know but cook was um after the match Stu, he was <laughs> we watched him a little bit last season getting a little bit rattled with his players this was was this the first time he really sort of went a bit crazy or not crazy is the wrong word but he was not very happy was he after the game yeah it wasn't quite we're like a bunch of sunday league players who've won a competition to play um but we did get it was absolutely shocking and we didn't know lack of hunger desire etc he's a man who wears his heart on his sleeve he's a man who really i think looks at a game through fans eyes first and foremost you know he talks about whether he enjoyed watching us play so i, I think he he doesn't come out and talk like a like a manager necessarily after a game he comes out and talks a bit like us watching it as, as spectators um what the players sort of make of that, I, I don't know. Um, be interesting to see what their reaction is is to this one. Sam Morsi's interview with with Andy afterwards was quite interesting. The way he kind of described Accrington, I'm sure that will get sort of picked up at their end and and be seen to be sort of a derogatory. He was certainly very unhappy about an incident towards the end where Harry Pell, who set up a goal and scored the other at one stage under zero pressure, just turned and thumped the ball out of the ground as hard as he could and it landed in somebody's back garden. Well, sort, of like that, sort of like a, a have it, have it moment. Sort of it, like, was, it was, it was exactly it. that. John Smith's have it. And, uh, well, some people, call, some people call that See, some people call that game management. See, the only thing the score is at the time. You see, if if, it, if Town were two 0 up and 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 one of our players, it'd be game management. Now it's it's apparently it's oh, well, and I want to speak to you, Andy, about this in a minute. Apparently, it's sort of non leagueish, which is well. I, I as a fan of non league, I I take great exception. That. Anyway, nothing, no problem with Accrington at all. I'll let Andy take up the story on Morsi, but Accrington had to do what they need to do, and they yeah, do absolutely. what works for them. And uh, it's listen, Accrington. I I always really enjoy the vibe around Atkinson. It's a lovely sort of family community club. As soon as you pull up there, they've got a marquee and music and Andy Holt, their chairman, sort of mingles with everybody. And there's something really wholesome about them as a football club. But I get the feeling there'll be one or two of those Ipswich fans that have probably silently vowed never never to go to the Wham Stadium again after their, their long journey and getting wet and always losing there but no I've, I've got no problem with with Atkinson and their approach you have to do what works for you but um I, I don't know whether those quotes looked worse in black and white than perhaps they did in in the person Andy you 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 were the man to interview him. um no I, I'm not sure they did um I feel the same about Atkinson by the way um it does feel like a nice place to be you kind of walk in through a residential street and then down a dirt track and all of a sudden there's like fans all milling down there and Andy Holt um, after the game, Andy Holt, um, I think after he'd Paul Cook had spoken to you, um, Stu, Andy Holt tried to get Paul Cook to come and look at the new building site that is uh, going on behind the, that stand, the main stand over on that side. And, and, and Paul did not want to go and have a look at uh, the building work that was going on. I think he politely declined and said he'd be back in a minute and wasn't. But um, going back to Morsi, um, I think quotes always look more stark in, in black and white. Um, and I would always look at a player and think yes you're you're doing this 20 minutes after a, a loss which you should be thoroughly thoroughly disappointed by but um he there was a definite anger about about Sam Morsi after after the game how much of that that was kind of directed inwards um and how much of it was directed outwards I think only only he will know but a very 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 disappointed captain who probably himself come down off off of a massive high um clearly hadn't enjoyed playing in that midfield uh, probably wasn't happy with the way he and his teammates had performed but but going back to what you said at the start Stuart, I don't think really and if you think about it 
if he's thinking about it now, you can't you can't blame Accrington for the way they approached this game. They won the game. Um, there, there was no, there was no like they weren't going around kicking people. They weren't going around kind of barging people around, were they? They were, they were just giving it to Ipswich Town, and um, and ultimately came away with a win. Smacks a bit of the. Do you remember the Cesc Fabregas comments about sort of Ipswich being a rugby side and everything? And that can that can fire you up a little bit sometimes. That just looks a little bit like sour grapes afterwards. The thing I take from it is I'm just pleased that Sam Morsey is pissed off that there is that anger yeah. in him, and that yeah. is a good sign that Ipswich should be annoyed, really, really frustrated and angry that they've that they've gone and lost a game like that with the greatest respect to Accrington. And I say this with, I know when people say with the greatest respect, it, sometimes it doesn't mean that, but Ipswich with the resources and the team that they've built and everything should be every game like this, that they, that they certainly lose should be, that should provoke that sort of reaction within. And that they now need to, to sort of turn that anger on themselves and use that as self-motivation to say that that can't happen again next time this comes along. Paul Cook's always talking about learning from experiences. This will happen again at some point and we will need to deal with it better next time it comes around. And I think also, Stu, I mean, you know, at the end of the day, they, they went up to Manchester United, was it, and trained a couple of days before the game. And, and you know, it's all very... You know, getting treated very professionally, getting treated like professionals. And I thought, I thought, I, I do, I, I completely understand. Um, Andy's completely right. You stick a microphone under somebody's mouth twenty minutes after a game when they're absolutely wild. They're going to say things. I think the non-league reference was a little bit uh, naughty. And I think if he'd had more time to think about, it, I don't think he'd have said that. Um, I, but I, I do agree. I think it's great. It's nice to see more as he is is peed off. That's what we want more of. Um, but uh, I mean, Ross. I mean, you, you also sorry, to... sorry to interject. I guess what he means by non-league is in terms of the the surroundings of the club. I mean, two thousand six hundred was the was the crowd. I think I saw. Um, I think it was Statman put on uh, Twitter that that's the lowest attendance it's which have ever played in front of for a for a league game in their history. So th- th- this is where this is the context of Ipswich Town. So when Sam Morsey's saying that, he's sort of Maybe he's probably referencing the surroundings of Accrington and where they've come from, and that ultimately Ipswich Town should not be losing to Accrington Stanley, mm. given the the context of what where both clubs are at. Maybe he means that more in a derogatory way to Ipswich rather than to mm. Accrington. Do you know what I mean? It's yeah. um, and and that is correct. Um, yeah, I think there, there's the definitely an element. There's definitely an element of that in what he was saying. I think. Yeah. I think so. There were things he weren't wasn't. Imp- pressed with from Accrington but I I think as much of those words were directed at him and directed internally at himself and his own team as they were towards Accrington if that makes sense and mm. and I think I, I think I agree with you Stu to, to come away f- from it seeing that level of anger and frustration at a result like that is quite a good sign from a player who let's not forget this is his first taste of this with Ipswich um We've had many players that have, you know, been wheeled out after games who who had defeat after defeat in this manner. This is the first one for Morsi. Um, and to see that level of anger and hurt in him is something that he won't want to repeat. So um, hopefully he's the kind of captain that can um, that can spread that anger and disappointment to the rest of his players to make sure that this never happens again, because this is a new Ipswich team. Um, it feels like they've been hurt by the same sort of Accrington punches that we've all been hurt by in the past. But actually, this is the first experience of this for, for all of them together. And it'll be really telling from this point how they how they deal with it. Because clearly in the past, it's something that that teams of Ipswich past have never sort of managed to to truly deal with. This one needs this one needs to if they're going to get anywhere near where they want to go. Mm, I think you're absolutely right, Andy. I mean, it's a bit of a, almost like a, feels like a line in the sand, really, in so much as you know we've been here before with town, but this is a completely new squad. Ross, I mean, obviously you spoke to fans afterwards. Um, I mean, you, you said you had to delete one video, which, um, you, like I said, we were deleting videos, so that's not new. But I mean, obviously, but the fans are still. I did watch the game. I mean, there's still there's still a lot of support out there. I mean, they they you know put up with a lot and still back the team, don't they? Yeah, I think there was. Over 800 fans there, you know, the fuel crisis and the weather not, you know, a bit bleak. And, you know, we've been to Accrington before and, you know, we've seen defeat. So I'm sure a lot of people have been put off going to Accrington. But, um, you know, these sort of games, if we want to get out of League One, we've got to win. 
Um, I want to big, give a big shout out to John Watson, a uh, friend of the show. I stayed around his on Friday night in Doncaster. A very good host. Um, his wife, Deb, and his uh, twins um, baked us cakes and all that. So that was um, the highlight of the Quickly, Ross, the, his twins who were kicked out of their own bedroom to accommodate yeah, you. Let, let's yeah. be let's be real about this. Is this yeah. true? Is this true, Ross? Yeah. I, to be fair, I didn't, you know, I said I'm happy to be on the, you know, on, on the couch or anything like that. But um, John said, yeah. You have one of the twins' beds. Go in there, enjoy. The poor, children, the poor children were kicked out of their bedrooms to accommodate you. Yeah, and 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 my friend Liam as well, of course. Liam you took Young. someone. You took someone else with you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, that's the only highlight of Accrington is uh, yeah, <laughs> very good hospitality from John Watson and Co. Um, but yeah, fans were you know they're still backing Paul Cook, but just they're just frustrated and disappointed. You know, from the highs of the six nil win to. So then going all the way to Accrington and seeing that performance, it's just like, oh, as I said at the start of the show, I hope that kills you, you know, as town fans. You just think we, we've finally got lift off here with all the signings, the summer like no other, and then then go to Accrington and lose. It's just like, oh, here we go again. It's exaggerated from an Ipswich Town point of view. I think amongst this, this fan base, amongst us that's followed it for so long, it, that, that this level of disappointment feels all the more crushing because there is that here we go again element to it and you hope that the players and management aren't tainted by that as much because they haven't lived through these kind of repeated disappointments. I think Paul Cook's got a, a sense of, I think he's spoken to enough fans and, and gets where Ipswich Town's fans are at. But as I keep saying, that this is this is built up over many years and it's always going to be bubbling under the surface and it doesn't take much to, to bring it. Maybe if you'd started from a blank slate, it, the reaction to this might not have felt as as strong. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah it's, it's the what it's the concern because we know how the last two seasons, the, well, the, yeah, the last three seasons where they've been and played at Accrington end, don't we? And I, and I think that's what you're saying, isn't it? That we, we know what a season that involves a miserable game at Accrington and loss can bring, but just plucking a player out, George Edmondson, George Edmondson couldn't care less that Ipswich Town were knocked out of the FA Cup at Accrington in January 2019 and then lost in the league um, uh, later that year. Um, so the hope has to be that, like you say, they're not tainted by it. It's not relevant to them as long as they as long as they react to this one, possibly like previous teams didn't. So, So that's got to be the hope. Mm, just absolutely. taking this season in isolation, it's it's about changing trends. And the slight worry for me is that now Ipswich have gone to Burton, Cheltenham and Accrington and had similar trends unfold. And you've got to be able to see those trends changing. Um, and there was, a, you know, if you then looked at the home games, that there was the trend was great going forward, but wide open at the back. And it took several games for them to kind of alter that trend it took the Bolton game for them to really get back to basics on on that front um so the only hope is that while the Bolton game proved to be a bit of a you know almost a blessing in disguise okay right this has to stop now in terms of being wide open and they changed a few things and and they got stuff right this game has to be okay that that sort of away performance cannot happen again and they've got to find a way now they've got to find an answer for for those sort of games not to happen because in league 1 there, there'll be some more games like that there'll be some more away matches that Ipswich find themselves in that scenario again and they've got to find a solution to it Mm, absolutely well. Well, look, we, we, we're sort of we, we're sort of thirty three minutes or so into into this uh, into this KOA podcast, my friends. I hope you're you're enjoying listening to Andy Warren, Stuart Watson, Ross Halls, and myself all chatting away a bit. Which is a little bit depressing sometimes, though, when they lose two one Accrington. We we need to cheer ourselves up a little bit. So I'm going to cheer us all up just to say, has anyone seen the new James Bond film yet? Uh, it came out on Friday. We were in Accrington all weekend. Um, sadly, not. Hmm. Have you? you have, you, have you? Have you, Mike? Well, no, I haven't. No, I know. I'm, I'm hoping to go this week. I just wonder if I was going to say if you have seen it, could you not talk about it? But seeing as none of us have seen, it doesn't really matter. Um, and also, while I'm on the, um, um, while we're doing a few sort of um, uh, 
um, sort of her church notices. Uh, Manscaped.com, of course, are our uh, sponsors here on KOA. And um, so support them if you can. Matt, I don't think we've got too much of the Manscaped.com, but apparently very popular, very, Mark, I know Mr. Heath loves loves their products. So that's very good. So go and, and go and uh, seek them out while you've got the opportunity. Um, okay, so um, what's up? Mike, who's, yeah. who's your favourite Bond before we move now, on? Now, now, you see, with uh, now my favourite Bond, you see, you probably my favourite Bond is uh, Roger Moore. And uh, followed quickly by Daniel Craig, to be fair. But Roger Moore, Man with the Golden Gun, wonderful. One of my, well, probably my favourite Bond, that and Skyfall, my two. What about you, Ross? Do you, do you watch Bond or do you watch Jack Reacher? No, no, Bond, Bond for me. Um, I'm not a big, big fan, but, um, you know, Daniel Craig is my era. Um, Roger Moore, I've heard of his name, but I don't know much about those Bonds. I have watched Golden Eye and all that, but... Uh, yeah, Daniel Craig for me. Uh, who was after we... him? Who was who was before him? Sorry, Pierce Brosnan. Uh, okay, nah, nah, nah. Daniel Craig. Stu, I guess Pierce Brosnan was kind of my era of Bond. Mm. I would say growing up, but um, Sean Connery. I do like a bit of Sean Connery. Ah, yeah, Sean's um, good, isn't he? But Roger Moore's a classic, isn't he? And James Grant, uh, James Daniel. <laughs> Daniel Craig Come has on, made Steve. things a little bit grittier, hasn't he, in recent years? And I've quite I quite like that. So um yeah, I do like a bit of Bond. Mm, I love it. I think Sky Skyfall is wonderful. Skyfall is a brilliant mm. film, I think. Well, right up there, Andy. I mean, are you a Bond man? Are you a Bond man yourself? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I quite like uh, yeah. I I think I think you have to like a James Bond film. Like, what what's not to like? I, I I would probably say that Daniel Craig's my my favourite of them. I'm the same as Stu, Brosnan. Brosnan is my uh, is my era, but the, but the best thing about James Bond, and I, you might you might agree with me with this one, Stu. Did you play GoldenEye on the M six on the N sixty four? What Classic. a game! What a game that was. That's the best thing that's come out of James Bond. Spent hours and hours and hours playing that game. Um, I, I must say I've not really really dipped into the kind of pre pre Pierce Brosnan Bonds mm. that much, but um. Give me. I, I might actually try and find a way of playing Goldeneye on the N sixty four, like an emulator or something. After this, when I finished mm. all of my work, of course, because um, mm. that was a lot of fun. You, we should have a, we should have a Bond night, really. The KOA team, I think, we should have a Bond night. We should bring 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 popcorn and and, and you know Coca Cola and stuff, and all gather around someone's house and have a do a couple, two or three DVDs, one after the other. We can come in your house, Stu. I think. You're making it sound like a sort of a teenage girl's sleepover. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, we can stay over if you like, but I mean, just a bond night would be fun. I just think, anyway, that's not anyway. Okay, well, look, that's well carrying on the carrying on the rather humorous thing. Well, I hope this is going to be humorous because I'm not really sure because you know the Accrington stand is it's amazing. I don't know about you, I'm a bit impressed, really. So I'm, I'm hoping can't wait for the next game to come along so we can win a match. Um, Andy, now I wasn't in the last podcast. I, I again I was obliterated from the money. Um, bets um, game that we play, I, as you know, you you gave me five, I had to spend five k my own money um, to take part when I a few a few a few weeks ago. But now, what is the situation with the latest um, betting odds? Did you win? Did you lose? Are we up? Are we down? So just to be, you you took five grand of your own money and just well you. Yes, because they, you joined in with the other guys, and you did. I wasn't on, and you and you sent me that text saying, "Well, if you're not on, you're going to, have to take five k of your own money." Now you don't say you didn't say that because you, you sent me the text, <laughs> and so I had to put my own money on. And what with, did with you the, put it on? I put it on the corner, the first corner that went out when Edmondson headed up behind whatever. I said it was going to be an Ipswich corner, and it was actually a Sheffield Wednesday corner. So I lost all my money. So I'm not I'm not playing anymore. So you better tell okay. the other boys. What what's happened this weekend? Tell our KOA army. Well, every, every cloud has a silver lining, doesn't it? And uh, and, uh, and uh, it was an excellent weekend for the million million pound picks pot. Uh, two bets were put on. Uh, one was Ipswich to win either half of the game, which which they clearly did. Macaulay Bond put them ahead at half time. Um, that won me sixty six thousand pounds on top of my original hundred thousand pound stake, and then I also had. A little twenty thousand pounds on Colby Bishop to score a goal, which uh, which he did, of course, and that's seventy thousand pounds, which means um, a nice little uh, nice little bonus to top up the account, and uh, all is looking good. So whatever one hundred and sixty six thousand six hundred and sixty six pounds plus seventy is is what I've uh, what I've added. So I'm back to nine hundred and sixteen thousand six hundred and sixty six pounds, only eighty five grand down. 
for the season now. So you, you put money on an Accrington player to score? Uh, yeah. Great. And he did. Yeah, well done. Really good. <laughs> oh, well, there you go. Anyway. Oh, well, that's excellent, Andy. Good news. And good. We're all pleased for Colby Bishop and our, our, our fake money that we don't really have that he managed to score for Accrington. That's great news. <laughs> um, so, anyway. Well, look, let's get back to the football, shall we? Because talking of talking of, of, of football fixtures, there's me just saying how much I desperately need it. We all desperately need it just trying to get back to winning ways. And they, well, they have a, a, a very quick opportunity, uh, Andy, because obviously tomorrow night is the EFL trophy, that well-loved, well supported trophy that we all love and all the managers love seem to love um and they're at Gillingham now I've just had a quick look at the table if town were to win everyone's on three points I believe in our super group of Colchester West Ham under 21s Gillingham and Ipswich um so it's boiling up to be an absolute corker is it not not Andy please please tell me you're excited Look, I, I really like this competition. Mike, just a quick uh, production note on this. We call it the Papa John's Trophy on here because we're, ah, we're trying to get we're trying to get some pizzas. free pizza. Pe- we are trying to get some free pizzas. So if okay, we could just Papa. call it just call it the Papa John's Trophy from here on out, please. Um, look, I like this competition. I know it's a bit of a joke, um, but I like it for those reasons. I like seeing I like seeing players that we've not seen for some time. I like seeing players get a chance, and this game. Is could be a real chance. Ipswich have just lost to Accrington. Um, Cook's not happy, and I think eleven players are going to get a go in this game, and 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 a few of them will be in like genuine territory of kind of twisting arm twisting arm territory. Um, these games serve a purpose. Um, ultimately, clearly, the trophy isn't that big a deal, um, and going to Gillingham um, isn't ideal. I've I think we can all feel like we've been to Gillingham and played against Gillingham enough over the last three years it's it's too much but i will always look forward to these games and i'm not i'm not embarrassed to say that roscoe now you'll t- you'll be you'll be trailing down there as well no doubt and take your camera to take some you're not going <laughs> no <laughs> not going go on plans ross gets rested in this competition oh you oh are you really is it oh you're you're rested for efl papa john papa john papa john papa john trophy games <laughs> Yeah, I, I, of course I want the free pizza, but um, although mm. we don't get that at games, it's not actually there. There's not a pizza in sight. I haven't even seen a pizza, uh, and mm. I've been to, I've been to two games in this group already this season. But no one else can say that. Um, no. I haven't seen a single pizza um, in sight. But to be to be fair, Ross, if you were to do like a game day fans video at these games, I dread to think what the away, uh, how many away fans there are going to be at, at this game. Um, it's an full open air away end as well, isn't it? So if it's a bit if it's a bit wet and windy again on Tuesday night, it's uh, it's not the not the greatest ground to be at, Priestfield. So Stu, Stu, if you so Andy's make a good point there about um, this could be a few people. It's um, I did read a quote from uh, Steve Evans, the Gillingham boss, ahead of this game, and he said he's going to obviously rotate players. He said rather than uh, not coming in his office complaining, they can go on the pitch and show him what they uh, what they can do. I mean, but there is a thing about this though. This, I mean, potentially tomorrow Ipswich Town could put out some, you know, some, some a strongish team of players who uh, have not been playing ninety minutes, but. Let's take Joe Piggott. Joe Piggott plays against Gillingham, OK, and uh, scores a hat-trick and they win 3-0. Is he really likely to start on Saturday against Shrewsbury? I mean, but this he, is the He'd argument, be a difficult he? one, wouldn't he? Because yeah. I don't think of all the players in that team, McCauley Bond's the one that you're not displacing anytime soon. Mm. And whether whether where else Joe Piggott fits into the 4-2-3-1, I'm not sure. They've maybe playing him sort of just off. Bond might be an option, but... It's going to be a strong team because they've got such a big squad now that you can afford to play, make 11 changes and still have a, a, a really senior first team 11 out in this competition. Um, I imagine it will be a sort of a 11 changes job, you would you would imagine, on Tuesday night. And as Andy says, you've got a real, you're probably going into this now. Had Ipswich just won at the weekend and got back-to-back wins, one of which being 6-0, you'd be going into this thinking... It's almost like a bit of a punishment, something you've just got to go through. And no matter how well I play, I'm not going to dislodge anyone. But I think most people will be going into this thinking, if I play well, I've got half a chance of getting in that team for for Shrewsbury on Saturday. Can I chuck a team out? There's 11 players that I've written down. There's going to be some that I think you'll probably want to discuss with me after this. But this is the team that this is the team that I, if it was me, that I would that I'd play. I'd keep Hladke in goal. I'd play Vincent Young, Enciala, Wolfenden. I'd play Miles Kenlock at left back. Um, Rakeem, 
We'll talk about that. Rakeem, Rakeem, Rakeem Harper, Idris El Mazzouni, three of Aluko, Chaplin, Edwards, and then Norwood. That's the team that I've got written down. Well, obviously, Mr. Kenlock is the is the is the is the big debate there, uh, Andy. I mean, you'd like to see him given a chance. He's not got a chance. Um, a chance it it it's a chance in name only. Um, right. With with Coulson injured, and I think out for maybe a little bit longer. Penny Penny's the number one left back. Um, I think they need to get Miles Kenlock off the books, and um, I, if it was me. I'd give him a game just to remind people that he exists and that there's a left back here um, that can play football. Mm. And Ross might dispute that last point um, that can play football. And just to, just to maybe try and move him on a little bit. I'd, I'd, I'd hope that his if he is involved at training, look, I think this is a long shot for, for him to be involved. I'm not suggesting he will be, but, if he's if he's coming in to train and his attitude's decent, despite the, the situation he's clearly in, miles away from it, never coming back into it under Paul Cook. It's not happening. But give him a game. Mm. Give him he a game. He won't play, Andy. It's not happening. I know. No, I know. I, I know. Put, I know. If we put a million pound picks now, I'd be pushing all of my chips into the middle <laughs> and saying I'm all in on Miles Kenlock not I know, featuring in this game. I know. I'm just Bailey Clements and Albie Armin have both had minutes ahead of him this season. Just well, chucking it out. Just you, He's just inside the area. Just you hang on, Stuga. It's not your million pound to go throw in the middle there. It's Andy's. He's the one who's got all the money. He can put what he... Don't you start playing with his money and provide a million pound, all that sort of stuff, please. Andy's got the million pound, you, Andy? I have, yeah. It's real money as well. Um, <laughs> look, look, I know, I know the deal here, but... Just a just a little theory, just a little theory from me. What what about uh, you said Hlaki in goal? What about if Christian yep. Walton is is over his injury? Is this okay, an ex- a reason to get him in the team? And and um, um, and if he came in and played really well, do you think Put Cook would be itching to sort of hmm. get him back in his league team as soon as this possible? Is, this is the uh, yeah. This is an interesting one, isn't it? Like clearly, Christian Walton was brought in to be the the starting goalkeeper when that happened at near the transfer deadline. Um, if he's fit to play, probably, yeah. I, my gut feeling is that he's maybe not. Um, but I'd, I'd play, I'd play Hladke over Holy, certainly, if it was a, if it was a, a situation of making that pick. You've got Hladke back in the team. You've got him playing well. I'd keep him playing. Um, Holy obviously had a nightmare against West Ham. Um, there is the, there is the prospect of Walton being back in, Back in and amongst it soon. Um, I'd 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 use this game to give Hladke another one to keep that keep that rolling for him, um, rather than rather than giving it rather than giving it to Holy. And Roscoe, where where do you you've heard Andy's team there? I mean, Kenlock aside, who you obviously would wouldn't start. But I mean, what about the rest of the, what about the rest of the rest of Andy's lineup there? Wolfenden back, and um, you know. Oh, at the end of the day, if we want to progress in this competition of course we've got a win at Gillingham um as you said earlier this is uh you know other, other teams have got three points already um the under 23s are playing well today and the team is out right now and uh Alcon Baggett and Bailey Clements are playing so Bailey Clements has been playing left back Alcon Baggett of course the the big center half um so one player there LB Armin is another youngster who played um again was he did he play against West Ham yeah yeah. So he's a defender, so he could be maybe involved there. Um, so he could possibly play left back. Um, but yeah, um, I just can't see Paul Cook playing a strong side. I know we want that momentum. We want to use these squad players. But I just, I don't know. He, oh, I think Norwood is a good shout, but I, I just don't know. I don't there's think there's players strong. I've not mentioned on there. So there's Caden Jackson, um, Louis Barry, which... He'll, is, he'll is play, on yeah. is on minute, but but do you do you play him? At, you, Edwards needs to be up to speed. You'd think for the weekend because Selena's Selena's not here for the Shrewsbury game. You'd think Edwards needs to be up for speed for that. Chaplin and Aluko need games. How do you fit Louis Barry into there as well? Caden Jackson isn't going to get a look in from the start. I wouldn't have thought. Mm-hmm. And then Joe Joe Piggott, I think, is only back training today after the virus that he's had. So I wonder whether he might actually not quite be ready for a start in this one and might be the. The half an hour from a bench, from the bench option, but um, Louis Barry's going back to Aston Villa, isn't he? It looks that way. I think. I think Selena signing was kind of the end potentially for him. Um, 
he didn't come here to play in Ipswich's under 23s, did he? Are you sad about that, Stu? Would you like to see more of Barry? He was an exciting signing on paper when he came, wasn't he? Obviously, very highly thought of Aston Villa FA Cup, uh, FA Youth Cup winner, fresh off the back of that. He, he played and scored for their senior team against Liverpool. Um, but yeah, obviously, Ipswich ended up signing players that they hadn't bet their mortgage on to get notably Selena, which is the one that's kind of changed changed the mm. picture for him. So that's just how it is. But the fact that he sort of played for the 23s and if he doesn't feat if he doesn't even feature in the in the, the Papa John's trophy game, then um the writing would be on the wall there, I, I would imagine. Um and yeah, that that three that Andy said behind the striker of you you want to get Carl Edwards back up to speed, you imagine Connor Chaplin scores against Sheffield Wednesday needs game time. Luco as well. It's hard. It's hard to see where he's, uh, he's. If that's the backup three, it's hard to see where Louis Barry's fitting into all of this at the moment. It's quite a strong. I mean, Andy's team there, Stu. I mean, you know, which is it's not miles off what what potentially it could be. It's quite a strong side. Yes, yeah, so Ross just said like, I can't see him playing a strong team, and I know what you mean in terms of playing the same first team eleven. But that is a strong team for this competition. Yeah. I mean, Gillingham. You went to the Colchester Gillingham game earlier in. in the... I did that. That is how much I love this, Stu. Good. Yeah. I, what was the Gill- Gillingham? Was all sort of kids and reserve uh, players? Was it? I'd say a similar vibe to the Ipswich one. They left out Vadane Oliver, who is the big striker. Dempsey, their captain, didn't play. Kind of a combative midfielder who I quite like. Um, but it was it was a senior a senior team missing. Note some notable faces, and also m- most notably missing Steve Evans, who wasn't who wasn't there. Just sent his assistant to run to run the game. Now I can't see him staying at home uh, and missing a game against Ipswich. Um, it's not Paul Lambert, his uh, his little touchline friend, but um, but he he likes playing against Ipswich. I think he enjoys the pantomime of it, and even mm. if it is a a Papa John's trophy game, he'll he'll want to win. So uh, he will return to the fold. Yeah, I'm I'm not bothered that much about this competition. Uh, to be honest, when Ipswich first dropped down, there was that sort of sense of excitement. Oh chance to go to Wembley and Ipswich haven't been to Wembley since 2000 and if you're not going so well in the league then some cup success kind of goes a little bit of a way to dampening that and you could make that argument this season the way the season's started that some sort of excitement all of a sudden you get through your group you win a two three games or whatever it is and you go into Wembley and maybe that gets the ball you know positive momentum going in the league as well but I bet if you asked any Sunderland or Portsmouth fan did getting to the final of the EFL trophy go any way to sort of taking the edge off the disappointment of still being stuck in the in the third tier? I, I imagine the answer would be no, wouldn't it? Yeah, of course it would. I mean, the league is obviously the main thing, but I mean, I, I don't know. I, I don't know if this... Uh, I mean, I, I say, I go back to the old days, Stu, of 1980s and all that, of course, when town were fighting on all fronts. And OK, they didn't win everything, but they still won something. And um, I... They, I think Ipswich, to me, Ipswich Town have got a really decent squad in this league one. There's no reason they can't attack matches with strong squads. They should have attacked the Carabao Cup game against Newport with a strong squad, a strong team. You know, to, to keep, to me, keep throwing the league at it all the time and just saying, well, I mean, Ipswich are sixth bottom. You know, to, to go to win at Gillingham tomorrow night with a strong side won't, will do no harm whatsoever, I would suggest. But, um, We'll have to wait and see. Um, well, we're, look, we're coming. We're not. We're not too far short from the end of the part. I hope you enjoyed it, um, um, Stu and Andy and Ross. I hope you're enjoying um, being here with myself and um, talking uh, Ipswich Town. Um, obviously, the the, K- the KOAR. The K- I noticed the KOA Army. Um, <clears throat> I've noticed some some photographs on Twitter um, over the weekend. Um, some sort of selfies with yourselves and um, the three of you all sort of posing like sort of a a a, a seb celeb. Hollywood A-listers, whatever you were, you know, with fans signing autographs. I mean, what's going on? I mean, it's what's all this about? I love, it's you know, I, I don't see any players. I don't see Ipswich Town players on Twitter. I see you three. What's what's happening? Lovely. There are friends. There are friends. Well, it's lovely to see. Don't get me wrong. I mean, I'm not, I'm not, not, not. It's just nice to see. I mean, are you up for this all the time? This sort of um, this selfie style type, you know. Stuart Watson's got a little bum bag like Neil Warnock's right? <laughs> with, with um. <laughs> With pre-signed pre-signed pictures of himself in it, and he hands. Oh, it was very you. nice to meet John Watson. We've uh, 
he, we've interacted with John a lot on social media, and he's, he's he's been a big part of all Ross's videos over over a long period of time, as have others. So when we get to bump into some of these guys in person, it's really nice, and um, you know we get to find out about him hosting Ross <laughs> and uh, Liam from Crew staying over at John's house. That that for me is you know it's just nice that there's that sort of it's so strange that you can jump in a car, drive for five hours, pull up, drive down a side road of a sort of a housing estate, walk. 50 yards around the corner and, and bump into people that you that you know and it's um people that you only kind of know via the world of social media at times and these little communities that we build via the various podcasts that cover Ipswich Town and that's that's the lovely thing about supporting football isn't it you take away the the, the results and the disappointment and everything else it's that sort of shared feeling um of being part of something, part of a collective, and um, <laughs> for us to kind of feel part of that's really nice as well. Yeah, even by that kind, of, by the end of it, you feel like you're questioning why, why you do. Uh, I'm sure many fans were questioning why they went to Accrington, but I saw loads of people talking about how they'd met up with people, particularly now when when kind of been away from fans have been away for games from games for so long, and this is only like a handful of away days into the new season, like meeting up with people who they've not seen for. For ages, it was nice to meet um, Mike, uh, another another star of Game Day. Ross, uh, excellent photographer. Saw saw Colin, who's a who's a, a family member of mine, who uh, bump into um, at away games all over the place. And um, yeah, it's nice, isn't it? I think Accrington brings out the best in all of that because it's so open and so um, yeah, just it's a nice place to to kind of meet people and, and interact. Um, and then the football comes. I was, I was looking at that stand that's getting built every time we go to Accrington, a little bit more is being built and improved. And you kind of think, how much of this is it town paid for with Caden Jackson, Janoy Danassian, <laughs> and now Cameron Burgess as well? That's probably a hefty, Ipswich have probably provided a hefty old chunk of their, their income over the last uh, two or three years and are probably helping them become that established League One club that they are. So, mm. um, Harry yeah. Pell was a bit of a player, did he? Harry Pearl was yeah, he named their man of the match. He um he scored, he got the assist. I was telling Andy before the game. <laughs> um, I've got a bit of history with Harry Pearl. Do you remember years ago, Mike? I think it was a 2009. I looked it up. I played in a charity game and I scored the equaliser at Needham yeah, yeah. Market. Needham Market, yeah. Harry Pearl. Uh, it was a bit of a sort of a, <laughs> it was a sort of a local a local side sort of made up of local level players and a. I was involved and a few others and it was the, the opposition was um sort of Hollyoaks and Emmerdale actors and people like that and uh Phil Daniels of uh sort of acting and music fame he of Parklife fame scored for the opposition I scored a last minute equalizer but I spent the game kicking chunks out of a young 16 17 year old lad quite a big lad and I got chatting to him in the bar afterwards and said oh who are you and he said oh I'm on, I'm at Charlton I'm on there their academy books, and I looked him up afterwards. He told me his name, and it's Harry Pell. So I've always kind of kept tracks on yeah. on him since. I mean, he obviously went to Colchester, and he's gone up there. So it was him who who hoofed the ball out of the ground and <laughs> angered Mister Morsey. Uh, it was quite an inventive little sort of back hill in a crowded area that set up the uh, the equaliser, and then he lashed home the winner as well. So, um, but he was far too yeah. polite to run past the press box giving you the V's, Stu. <laughs> Well, for all the kicking you did to him that afternoon, he he won't have any recollection of that, I'm sure. But um, <laughs> he's a big yeah. boy, isn't he? He is. We talked about sort of. I remember when they missed out on Matt Crooks in the summer, and I sort of said to Andy, "There's not many Matt Crooks about of his type. You don't get those sort of big, solid, physical number ten types. Um, they're pretty rare." But Harry Pearl was a kind of a, a version of that. He sort of played that same sort of Matt Crooks role, really. That's caused Ipswich problems in the past. So dealing with those sort of big number 10s um, is something Ipswich need to to, uh, to work out how to do. <laughs> oh, that's not Harry Pell. Look, look at that. I see. With <laughs> hey, Stuart Watson. <laughs> Gosh, Stuart. And he's look just fl flashed up a picture here from that game. And that that man sort of swatting me aside from afar is um, Cyril Regis's brother. Uh, wow. I don't know. Has, in for the showbiz 11. Look well, isn't that, that hair? You, you have got a full head of hair there, my friend. Yeah, that's before you started following. Cyril Regis' brother, look. Hang on a second. Look what I've got here. 
Whoa. Oh, you can't. There you go. Spooky. Cyril Regis, my story. That's a book up on uh, on my shelf there. Still great book. That is great. Cyril Regis was a terrific centre forward, my boys. I don't know if you saw, you saw him play, but you wouldn't have seen him play, I'm sure. Fantastic striker, Cyril Regis, West Brom. Um, what are your other books? Is that Novak Djokovic? Is that Novak Djokovic? Uh, no, uh, no. It, 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 as, that's Mr. Nasty, Ily Nastasi. Ily and I've who's, got a, who's at the top? That's Nastasi. I've got Mike Atherton at the bottom. Okay, Mike. I, that was who I, I, that's who I Mike thought was Djokovic. Uh, <laughs> Mike no, Atherton and Novak Djokovic. I once interviewed Mike Atherton when I was a trainee journalist over down at Hastings Way. We, he had a big, he had a big uh, function. I was, well, I was allowed to interview him. He was, he was quite exciting. Um, right. Well, well, look, guys, we come. Um, Dave um, Regis, his name is. I've just looked him up. He played Dave, uh, yeah. played for Southend during the nineties and a string of other clubs in a sort of a solid football league. See, Stewie, Stewie has mixed and played with some of the best. He's not just he doesn't just write about the game. He's experienced it at those sort of levels. <laughs> this is My job that day was to win it and give it to Kevin Horlock in midfield. <laughs> Well, look, guys, we've come to the end of um, of our um, of our Kings Bank. Um, obviously, I've, I've stood in for for, for Heathy here, who we hope will have recovered um, from from the awful um, experiences of the of the highs and the lows of, of Ipswich Town. Um, he's hoping to. Um, I know he's hoping to get out of bed uh, this evening and just take a walk round uh, Heath Towers, which is about four acres. So he should be he should have a nice long walk. Uh, at this point, he usually says any other business, which I don't really know ever what that means because none of us really ever have any. Ross. So I'm going to come to you first. Papa John's trophy you're not going to tomorrow. So have you got anything lined up for tomorrow or are you just are you just on day off? What are you doing? It's my niece's birthday. Ah, and her name my is? Niece. Alana. So I'll say happy, up, happy, happy, happy Alana. Birthday. Happy birthday, Alana, for everybody. Yeah. And uh, yes, yeah, so that's that's what you're doing tomorrow. You're eating, so you're eating birthday cake most of the day. Birthday cake. Um, of course, you'll be at school for most of the day, but you oh. know, in the evening there's a little party going on. So I'm going to enjoy that instead of going to Gillingham. So yeah, um, you but also cool. hmm? carry on. I want, I want to say a big shout out to, of course, um, Harvey Davis and his dad Terry, who are at Aquiton as well. Always good to see them. Of course, Harvey Davis is the sweet Welsh prince, friend of the show. And um, I don't know if you were going to line this up already, but we've got to mention Ben Diaf, who of course ran in the London Marathon um, and did an absolute great time. Three hours and thirty-three minutes with his brother Dan. That is good timing. Um, just fantastic from him. Great stuff, Ben. Three hours, 33 minutes. I mean, of course, wow. Well, I can't even think of, of how on earth we could run for three hours and 33 minutes, Stu. Eh? I could hardly walk for that length of time, let alone run it. But uh, any other business, Stu, for, for yourself? Are you uh, looking forward to the big game tomorrow? Uh, uh, yes. <laughs> Just embrace it. Go with it. It is what it is. Enjoy it. Andy for what loves it. Is. Andy, Andy loves it. I mean, he's, he's this is the happiest I've seen him ahead of a game, to be honest. I do. I, I really enjoy it. It is what it is. It's not It's not the top priority. It's uh, It's not great, but I just love it anyway. It just it is what it is. Enjoy. I'm going to enjoy watching Toto and Ciala play, who I'm sure will play again. Another chance to see Idris play. Um, I like it. Toto's hair's gone, by the way, we noticed. The, uh, yep. He was growing out a bit of a... Bit of an afro, wasn't he before? But that's uh, that's gone. We're back to to ball toto. Mm. Oh well, there you go. Well, there you go. So we finish on. Well, look, uh, people, um, king of kings of kings of Anglia army. I hope you've enjoyed me standing in for the for the Heath monster for a little while. He'll be back at the end of the week, like I said. All, all being all being well. And um, um, so look, thanks. Um, as we said about manscape.com, support them and, and back them, and for them supporting us. And um, you know, get, get your little bits and bobs trimmed. Apparently, that's what it's used for. Um, so anyway, um, so I'm Mike Bacon. I hope you've enjoyed listening to me and and the rest of the guys here, Andy Warren, Stuart Watson, and Ross Halls. We'll be back at the end of the week. Um, and like you say, uh, hopefully, town to talk about a town victory at Gillingham and look ahead. To the match against big game against might be international weekend coming up but town are still playing which was be the first time for a little while on international weekend which is great that home to shrewsbury talk about that later in the week and we will um we'll speak to you again sometime cheers poncho heath monster <laughs>